You have now arrived at your destination. Tony, this is such a joy to do. You know I always love our chats. As we said, like, the schedule's here, and we're not going to use it at all. But thank you for joining me first. Thank you, Harry. Thanks for having me on again. It's always fun to, always fun to talk with you and, and chat. So let's see what happens today. Listen, this will be great. I want to start with the little bit of context. We always have to start with a bit of storytelling. So tell me, how did you make your way into the world of startups? How did Apple come to be? How did Nest come to be? I mean, summarize your life in two to three minutes. It's a very simple summarize question. Summarize my life? Uh, let's see. I've been a geek since birth. Oh, well, not birth. Well, almost birth. Uh, you know, geek with analog tools and, and hammers and nails and all that stuff at like age two or three. And then you know, wound up having a tool called a computer when I was about 10 years old, nine, 10 years old, something like that, and and fell in love with writing my first programs. And when I say write, I mean write uh, with a number two pun- pencil on a bubble card, uh, like literally, you know, writing code via, uh, you know, uh, pencil marks on a card that you'd set into a mini computer, a mainframe, and uh, it would print out on a paper terminal. So no graphics, it was all text. There was no disks even, there was no cloud, there was nothing. Um, so that's where I got hooked. And then I just followed that journey from writing software to making hardware and software and just continuing along and, and, and followed my heroes after trying startups and stuff like that, followed my heroes out to, to Silicon Valley at a company called General Magic, who was the Mac team creating the, uh, creating the iPhone just 15 years before the iPhone came out. We were doing it too early. It was a crazy ambitious project with so many very smart people. You got to check out the movie, the General Magic movie, if you haven't seen it. It's a documentary about the greatest startup that had to die to spawn all of these amazing things. So that that was it. So General Magic was the start of my Silicon Valley career. Fast forward uh, over, you know, almost 30 years there and out came, uh, uh, you know, the iPod and the iPhone and Nest and its line of products. So in a nutshell, been a geek, always been a geek, continue to be a geek um, and, and had just a lot of fun along the way and a lot of failure and a lot of learnings. And that's what Build in our book is all about, is Build's all about all, not just the successes, but mostly about all the failures. The thing that always strikes me when it comes to product is, is fundamentally whether it's art or whether it's science, whether it's data or whether it's gut. When you think about this question, actually Belsky had a great answer to this one, so no pressure on the He question. always does. He's always. such a smart guy. But how would you describe product being science or art, data or It's intuition? both. It's both. In fact, in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the book, there's a chapter called, you know, data versus opinion. And really what it's about is when are certain decisions opinion-based decisions, you'll never get the data to be able to make a decision and you need an opinion just to follow through. Or do you is this a really a data-driven decision, something where you can collect enough data to then choose the right thing. And a great product of version 1.0 is an overlap of some insights, not necessarily data, because more or less that product probably didn't in, in, you know, didn't exist before, or maybe some different version of it, but it was not literally the same. And then there's a lot of opinion on what we should do. And those things overlap. And that should be an incredible way of understanding what you're trying to do. There is no such thing as only art and only science. It is about art and science and storytelling that really pull it off to make a great product happen, whether that's a consumer product, an all Adams product, a bits product, a bits plus Adams product, or a business product. It's all about art, science, and the way you storytell or communicate what it is. Can I ask, do you think for you and also for like much more seasoned, incredible product leaders, the gut and opinion increases over time and data decreases with increasing confidence that you know what you're doing? No, I wouldn't say that. I think as you go through successive versions, you get better and better data from people who are actually paying for whatever it is you're doing. You know, you're getting revenue in some form. So those people have real opinions because they're using it and they're paying you for it. It's not like they're just getting it free and going, oh, yeah, I like a free service. Who's, who doesn't like a free service, right? So it's it, one thing is to really understand you're going to have a lot of data-driven arguments about refining the product, doing new things. But then at the same time, you're going to have new ways of where to take that product or add new products to it. And you really need to, 
you know, they're going to go back to that opinion based thing. So you're going to go back and forth the entire time. And if you only take opinion, you know, moving forward, forget it. You know, a lot of times your opinion was wrong when you had a failure. So go understand what was wrong there. Was it your opinion? Was it some something you didn't get right about the target customer or their needs or something like that? But later on, you can't just trust opinion. You have data and you have customers doing it. So talk to them. But you, anybody who has got the hubris to think that their opinion always makes, you know, makes the most sense and th th that is the way it's going to be, that's absolutely wrong. It's a good way to get started, but it's not the way to actually win a market, not a way to, to you know, really be successful. Oh, Tony, I've missed you. I've missed our conversations. <laughs> uh, t t tell me, we we've got data and we've got opinion there. Can you take me to a time that stands out for you? You mentioned, obviously, the book being centered and discussing quite a lot, some failures and some challenges that you faced. If you think about data and then opinion and the two opposing, can you take me to a failure that you've had in the past where you lent on one or the other my opinion so there this was back in at phillips so phillips we were making mobile handheld communicator products okay they were precursors to you know kind of the handhelds we have today but they were like palm pilots these kinds of things and i all the data told me all the data so we already shipped the first product all that and people are saying we need to go to color screens the first product was grayscale screens and all the um, data told me, don't go to a color screen. It's going to wreck your battery life. It's going to, it's going to do all of these things. It's going to make the device bigger, more expensive, heavier. The battery life's going to be horrible. Like there's so many downsides with going to color. Don't go to color. Stay black and white, right? And what happened was we did all that, and the the market took off with color screens. Why? Because the emotion of color was so strong over the data that said, no, black and white is better for all of these usability reasons, was not enough. So you sometimes, even though you might have the right data, the old, you have to really understand your customer's opinions and understand what their emotional needs are, not just their practical needs are, and put those together. And so obviously we got it wrong. We put a, the black and white or grayscale screen out, got it wrong and had to rev it quickly after that. But those are those kind of transitions in the market where you're like, well, this is a, it doesn't make sense from the data perspective, but it does from the emotional perspective. Well, actually, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to push back on you, and it's easy for me in the benefit of hindsight. That's one type of data being the bomb cost, being the, you know, the unit cost, being uh, the battery life. But the other data would be customer insights and customer discovery. Did you do that there? Because there it would seem like that would have guided you in a different direction. We, we absolutely did that. Um, there, uh, there were no other, you know, there were laptops with color screens. But there were no little devices with color screens at that point, really. You know, this is 1997, right? Even Palm Pilot was still black and white or grayscale. There hadn't been that shift yet. And so this was when is the right time to make that shift from grayscale to color. So you could ask, you know, again, you can ask customers, do you want that? And they go, of course I want color. But then you say it comes with all these other things. And they go, I don't know if I want color. But really, at the end of the day, they won't tell you what they really want, which is when they're at the store and they see, or, you know, that was back then, they see that colored display next to the black and white ones and they go, oh, I'm going to just buy that, right? It costs more, or it has worse battery life, whatever. I just want that. It's cooler, right? So you can't always just trust what the customer says because what happens is our framing of it, you know, when we're, we're asking them, right. we're asking the questions, come with all the other, oh, well, if you bought it, it would be like this, 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 and this. And then here are the cons. Like we gave them the review, so to speak. But they don't get that when they're in the store. They just get the, uh, the gut reaction, right? And they go, oh, I want that, right? So, you know, it's, no, and it's not always so easy to know what, is, is what a customer says what they really want versus, you know, what, uh, what uh, they'll, well, what they say they want versus what they actually do. When did you have an opinion and you were like, you know what, this is the way, I feel it in my gut and I'm going with my intuition here. When did you have that and it went wrong on the flip side? When it went wrong? Yeah. Well, my gut was telling me to go grayscale, right? 
what the you, data you, and my gut told me that was the right way to go. Did you ever go against the data when your gut told you otherwise? Sure. You know, the data, I, you know, at, at NEST, at NEST, there was this argument the whole time when we shipped our first thermostat, when we shipped the very first thermostat, we included a very expensive tool inside the package. And it was a screwdriver with changeable bits so that when you got it right out of the, you know, of the box, you could start mounting this thing to your wall, your new product on your wall, taking the old one off, putting this on and have a, a little tool set with you to be able to do that. And then you could always have, and it was Nest brand. It was a little tool. I should have one here, but I don't. Um, and it says Nest on it. And you could then keep it in your desk drawer or in your kitchen drawer or whatever with your tools. And you would always have this reminder of Nest. It was a marketing thing as well as an out of box thing. Well, every single time we would have a new rev of the product, do we have to keep the screwdriver in the box? Do we have to keep the, it costs us X, Y, Z amount of money. I'm like, do we need it in there? That's our marketing. That is a sign of the brand of the care we take because we custom designed the screwdriver. It wasn't just a, you know, something we bought and we put a brand on it. We literally designed the whole thing. And people would fought, fight every single time. It'll reduce the cost for shipping. It will make the box smaller. It will make our, our, our margins higher and higher. And I can, no, 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 right? And so that was the opinion of like, the brands matters, guys. These are intangible things that we get through the brand and that people see in the real world that we can't put on our, you know, on our COGS line or our seeing benefits directly to the business. But there are there, we see it, we see people talking about it online and YouTube videos and installation, all that stuff. We're going to keep doing this, right? So that's another thing of like the data says, don't get rid of it. Or it's the data says, absolutely get rid of it. But the opinion was like, no, 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 no. There's something, a higher order bit here that we're not, we're going to miss if we, if we take that out of the box. Can I ask, how do you think about the trade-off between product and customer experience there versus business rationale and unit economics because you're not going to have a great business if you don't have great customers who love your brand so you, you got to work within constraints but if it means it's going to be let's say 10 percent more expensive because of all these little bells and whistles that you add around it that might be the right thing because that's the marketing that's in in the in the field marketing in the field that happens that you go okay I'm willing to, you know, invest in that because that marketing is going to carry long beyond when they initially unbox or use the, the, the software the first time. They're going to be able to see that marketing over and over and over, right? So it's just because it, 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 your unit economics might not be as attractive from a business perspective, you're making investments in your brand. You're making investments in what you stand as a company. And those are the things that people take away and remember. It may not feel direct, but it really is direct sooner or later when they tell their friends about it, right? Or when they rem remember when they saw that tool in their desk and they go, oh, yeah, I had such a great experience with that, you know? Oh, maybe I should reconsider them as a brand for another product that I want to buy. So, yeah. Yeah. Sometimes it doesn't make logical sense from the financial point of view. But look, if we were going to create new products all based on finance, we would not have the world we have today because people imagined something bigger, something greater, and then took those opinions and turning it into something and said, now it is the way it is, right? And this is, this is the problem that we have with climate. A lot of people are saying, well, I can't replace this material with that material. It, is, it costs more. It might be functionally equivalent, but it costs more, but it helps the planet. Yes, yeah, so what? It costs me more. Well, have you ever thought about what your customers might want? What they might be turning towards? You got to have a bigger vision of what the needs are of the individual customer as well as the collective customer and go, wait a second, maybe this would be better for the planet overall and I'll get these new customers that wouldn't consider our product because we're doing something smart here for the for the environment. Oh, and by the way, typically, yeah, it might be ex more expensive today for that material, but as soon as that volume hits and we get it, it takes off, actually it's gonna be cheaper than the petroleum-based product because it's built with plants and it's easier to make the plants than you know suck oil out of the ground. 
So these are those kind of trade-offs where people are like, I got to stay with the status quo because my economics say so versus, oh, I might be losing customers. There might be a better way of doing it. I'm making an investment on a new set of customers that I need to have and to keep my business going, you know, going well into the future. And by the way, the margins might improve. It might actually be better than it has been. So it takes imagination. It takes leaders uh, who really see the bigger picture than just the, you know, the, the numbers people in the back always hacking and slashing saying, no, 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 no. Can I ask, I want to go back to the screwdriver, actually, because it reminds me of my conversation with Scott on the first mile experience. And he said, everyone does the first mile experience. So shit. So shit. And so my so question shit. to you is, like, if we think about that screwdriver, that's a moment of delight for the user when they open it up and see Correct. that you've thought about it. What to you, how do you think of what makes a great first mile experience? Every customer touch point, And this is in the book, a customer journey, right? We talk about making the intangible tangible. And that is specifically about what, is, what are all the customer touch points along the way. When you start, when they first learn about your brand, when they learn about your products, when they learn about other people using the products, reviews, all, when they go to shop for it, whatever it is, you know, what are the loyalty things once they get out of box experience, what's the loyalty things at the end? Understanding that entire customer journey. You have to look at that whole thing. That's the, as, as, as Scott said, the first mile. You know, we always talk about the last mile. How do we get it to somebody's house? How do we deliver something faster? The last mile delivery, the last mile of internet connectivity or the last kilometer of internet. How do we get the fiber directly to the home? How do we get the package directly to that person's hand? We optimize so much of that. We do, you know, a lot of places do a great job of that. Why aren't we thinking about what about once that, that package is on the doorstep or, or that software downloads happening? What are the next steps after that? To, to where they have this amazing product experience, if you spend a lot of time on that, why aren't you spending all the other time on the other parts of the experience to make sure to remove the friction so when they get that, that out of box or that first installation, that first experience of the product, they go, wow, they didn't go, finally. God, I got through that gut-wrenching experience. Each experience and touch, customer touch point should build positively on the last one and keep and all the way to the first experience of the product should be even better, right? It should be stellar. So you just have this step up effect and emotion, positive emotion, all the way to the first usage. And you go, holy shit, this is amazing. I love the entire journey. Not, I had this great product, but man, it was so hard to buy. It was so hard to this. Oh, I didn't understand. It was too complicated. What are you doing? If you don't make a great, a, a great, you know, last mile or first mile experience, depending on how you want to talk about it, who is? I, my question to you is: You're you inflicting know. that pain on everyone. Everyone who buys your product, and you're trying to say, "We love you, customer. We trust you. We we want you to have these superpowers we've created for you." Well, make it easy for them. You said about that first mile there and like really making it a joy for the consumer. You know, it was actually Dave Marin that said before, the devil's in the default. And I guess I'm always stuck on this one, Tony, because I'm like, don't consumers like the default? They know the default. It's comfortable to know what they have done before. Sure. But, but why is the devil in the default, do you think? And do you agree with him in that respect? Yes, the default is, you know, 98% of the time, Everybody just wants a simple, easy experience. What happens is, is we sit here, especially for reviewers, you know, there, the, you know, there's newer reviewers who are much better at this now because there's so much competition in reviewing. But, you know, when I was growing up, it was all about bits and bytes and feeds and speeds and, and numbers. You know, you can get this a lot from, you know, all the gamers with FPS, frames per second, and how many polygons. And, you know, you can get into the weeds. And sure, that is a set of people who will love that stuff. But what happens is, is the marketing departments, they all center around these types of reviews that they think are make or break that are based on all these numbers. When they forget 97, 98, 99% of people, maybe even more, depending on the product, don't care about all that stuff. They just want it to work. They bought it to solve a pain. They didn't buy it to get more pain. Why did they buy something to get more pain? Why are we giving them more pain in the first mile experience when you think you've solved their pain, you know, just beyond the first mile experience? It just, it makes no sense to me. 
I, I totally get you there. My question to you is, you said about kind of the reviewers on the kind of consumer side and on the kind of... Business uh, side, too. Yeah. But I want to ask you about in-product teams. Uh, how do you think <laughs> about product reviews within product teams? How do you like to conduct them? What makes a great one great versus average? Uh, great question. And I did one. I did a product review this morning. Great. Um, so I can draw from that experience. The first thing is making sure everybody's on the same page as who are we designing for? Who is the audience and what kind of experience are we trying to go for? And having analogs of those experiences that we thought were great from other products or other, other things that we've experienced in our past, which ones were great and what would we like to draw from those experiences into the one we're trying to create ourselves? So who is the target customer? Really well, understand all the different customer groups, but what is the main, main target? What is our goal? Are we trying to grow new users? Are we trying to retain existing users? What have you? And then it's like, what's, what's the percentage of that? And sometimes we'll like go, it's a third, a third, a third. I'm like, well then, you know, we're gonna please, we're gonna try to please everyone and please no one. So pick one. So you gotta pick one. There's always gotta be a one priority path. If not, you've probably not structured your product right. Um, so you pick that primary path and you optimize everything around it and you bring experiences that you've loved that is similar in a way in some analog that you can then project on that to look at it and go, what about this detail? What about that deal? Too many people stay so inward about this step, that step, this step, that step. They don't step back and they go, well, what's a different way of doing it? Where can we remove steps? Where do we actually add one step, but we can remove 10 steps down the line? All of those things need to be considered. Um, uh, in, in fact, in, in this morning's design review, there's like two teams in this onboarding. There's one team that's doing this piece and another team that's doing that piece, but they're not talking together. And I'm like, you know how many steps we could remove because people go down this, they go down this one and then they come up and then they go down this style and this to the two different teams. I'm like, smash them together. Let's see what we can do differently when we put those things together, because you know, they, these can be big projects. So it's those kinds of details. That Can you I ask, have to how, how, how do you, and I, I'm not like um, being too sycophantic to you here, but like how do you extrapolate yourself up enough to go, okay, let's remove ourselves from the details and let's look at what we can do to remove 10 steps, not one. Because it's so easy to get so ingrained in the minutiae that you can't extrapolate yourself up to that level to see from that view. How do you retain the perspective to do both, do you think? Well, you... You, it's a, you have to train yourself. You have to train yourself to put the hat on from a company perspective or a designer perspective. What am I designing? How can I, you know, how, what are the, all the details? Then there's another one, which is staying beginner and staying your, your first time customer. They don't understand the space. They're coming into this space for whatever reason, because you, you're solving this pain. How are they going to think about it? And thinking like they might think and put your, do like role playing out of like, why did, why did this come up on the screen? I don't understand. And always just playing, you know, like asking the dumb question. Why? Why am I being told this? What's going on? You know, and it really, you know, people are like, they laugh about it. But I'm like, why are we doing this? Why do I even need to do this? I don't understand. So I'm always this, uh, you know, how can I say, um, gruff character. Like, tell me why I need to do two more steps, you know. Convince me I need to do this so that, you know, once you get through it, then we really know what we're honing down into. So you got to look at both from a design perspective, but you also have to look from a customer perspective and make sure the emotions and the rational pieces are all lined up all the way through that journey. Can I ask, you mentioned before about um, essentially trying to be too much to too many people in a lot of ways. And I find it with product marketing a lot, especially as people approach launch, they get more and more nervous that no one's going to adopt it. And so they expand and broaden product marketing just in a desperate attempt that someone uses it. And then they mean nothing to no one. Um, what are your, like some big lessons for you in terms of what makes the best product marketing in that messaging that resonates? That's usually what you're describing is a symptom of not getting product marketing involved at day one, day zero. Usually it's a bunch of things getting thrown together. All these different what's are being thrown together. And then at the end, 
It's like, we have eight weeks. We're going to ship this product or 12 weeks. Now go and market it. It's like, but why did we build it? Who is the target customer? It's all of those things. So all of these questions come up and then people go like, why did we make this decision versus that one? Because the audience needs or the customers need this versus that, blah, blah, blah. Did anyone talk to the customers? So you have to start when you start a new project is you have to start early days in, and what I always say is build the mock press release. What is that page, page and a half press release that you're going to you know, send out six months, nine months, a year later about that product? You talk about the audience, the problem. You talk about the solution and how you're differentiated. You talk about um, price and availability. You talk about regions and all that stuff. And it all happens in one page to one and a half pages, right? Because that's all you can do when you want to tell the world what you're building, right? And why it matters. So the faster you can make that document in the early days, it's like your Occam's razor. Like you've, you've winnowed it down enough to know that you have a great story. You know the messaging you're trying to tell. You know the audience you're going after. Now you just got to deliver the product. You know, that's the vessel. Now you got to fill the vessel with the technology. Too many times, here's the technology and here's this thing. And now you've got to wrap, perfume this pig with marketing around it. And people are like, that's ah, just marketing. That's fucking bullshit. <laughs> Can I ask the other thing that I think is bullshit? I think it's like the, you know, like um, you know, David Moran said, devil's in the default. I think the devil's in the neutral when it comes to product marketing. There's so much product marketing, which is just bland. It doesn't mean anything. And I think you've got to be bold. You've almost got to be arrogant and say a thousand songs in your pocket. You're not saying a great musical device. You're like, fuck You're this. You're absolutely right. Bang. If you don't believe it, why should anybody else? If you believe it and you're going to you're going to put a year or a six months or two years of your life and your team's lives on the line, working nights and days and weekends and what have you and traveling all around the world to make this stuff happen. Why wouldn't you be bold? Why don't you go shout from the rooftops and wave the flags and go, look what we've got to everyone? I think people either it's insecurity, it's either it's insecurity, either on the product or in the team and that's because you probably haven't sold yourself on it. You haven't gotten resonated because you've been just working on it as opposed to believing in it and really using that, you know, the, the, the finer points to say this is in, this is out, these kinds of things. I, you know? I, I think it's a lack of confidence where they're fearful of putting a customer segment off by being too bold. Guess what? That's called differentiation. Differentiation means I'm going to attract only a certain number of people and I'm going to make sure it's so great for them and hopefully that's a big enough set that they're going to resonate with it. It's not for everybody, right? Are iPhones for everyone? Not everyone can afford an iPhone. No, it's for a certain set of people, right? Max as well. You have to remember your target audience. If you just want to say it's bland for everyone, well, who wants it? No one's excited. I want you to talk to me, not a swath of people. I want you to resonate and I want to hear from you what I mean to you and what this product means for me and what it's going to do to help me. If it's just this bland stuff, well, that means you got bad marketing or you got a bad product or both, right? Or, and also bad leadership. You got to be, you got to stick to your guns. And I remember this very, very clearly. Steve said the best marketing, Steve Jobs, the best marketing is just truth telling. As long as the product meets the expectations you set for it, the best marketing is just telling the truth. It's not all kinds of hyperbole and adjectives and all this other stuff. It's just telling the truth. And when you tell the truth and you deliver on that truth, the solution to that pain, that's when things happen. That's when things really go. Marketing people think it's just like, you know, putting, you know, wrapping, gift wrapping something and putting bows on it and flowers and stuff like that. That is not what, what true marketing or product marketing is. What do you think makes the best product marketers? I consistently hear from founders say the hardest role to hire for great product marketers, great product marketers. It's absolutely true. What do you think so, makes a great product marketer and how do you... Well, there's a whole chapter in the book on it. 
<laughs> There's a whole chapter one explaining what product marketing is because most people have no clue what it is. Okay, what, what, what they think they do, but they really don't. Well, I think I know what it is, so I'm clearly wrong as well. Well, what, what is it? I, what is it? It's my fucking podcast. I ask the questions. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, I hear it's a test here. Uh, no, no, seriously, you know, product marketing, product marketing is as mar- much of an art as it is a skill, and the skill is really understanding how to communicate to various segments of customers in their language, communicating in their language in marketing, in engineering, in customer support, in finance. These these product marketers, the best ones, know how to speak the languages of all these different disciplines to make sure that they're hearing what it means, why we're doing this product and what it means for finance, what it means for customer support, what it means to the various target customers, right? they have to have a really great ability to understand the messages that need to be told to each of these organizations or these, these different individual um, you know, segments of people, as well as understand the technology of what can actually be delivered. Because too many things is like, oh, this is a great design. It can do everything. But nobody can deliver it because no one can build it. So it's having those dialogues and, and, and finding a common ground because you're not the CEO of the product. Too many times the CEO goes, oh, yeah, the product marketing will figure out. No, product marketing is the voice of the customer first and foremost. They are the voice of the customer who then puts puts together all of the things that they hear around to make a story that works for the customer and works for the business. Okay, assuming everyone else delivers. So product marketing is it can be more technical and it can be much more consumer or more marketing driven. But it's always somewhere in between, depending on the product that's coming out. Is it a highly technical product? You're going to probably have more technical product management. If it's more consumer, you're going to go from the probably from the mid to the of the tech to, you know, more consumer marketing driven things. So it really depends uh, what the product is that's coming out. But product marketing sits in between all of these things. Almost nobody reports to them. So they have to earn respect by communicating to each team in their or these groups of individuals in their language and earning their trust and then putting together something that makes sense for everyone um, within reason. For founders hiring product marketers, I often hear from mostly engineering led founders saying, I- I've continuously mishired because they're obviously good at marketing and they're good at marketing themselves. And I have mm-hmm. not detected in the interview process this. So my question to you is, what are the questions or tests or tangible things that you would do to discover really great product marketers pre-hire in that interview process? Oh, I, you know, to me, the biggest thing is, tell me the last two or three things that knocked your socks off when you purchased it and why. Like, what are the amazing product experiences you've had? And tell me why those are so important to you and what it means to you as a customer and what do you think it meant to those businesses and why internally to each of the teams. So I want to see how they, they put their mind into the space of the different customer segments, into the different teams inside of an organization, why it was successful, what, what did they throw, what did they leave out that was good that they left out, if you can kind of ascertain that, or what did they leave in that's really important they left in, or how did they move it, evolve it from generation one to generation two, generation three, generation four. So I want to have that kind of discussion, right? That's when you know if somebody's not bullshitting you, because too many product marketers can come from the marketing realm, but they just understand creative and branding. Mm. Messaging is very, very different than creative marketing and communication. Messaging is the core things for why it is the way it is. It may turn into different words and, and visuals and videos and stuff like that. But product marketing is all about the messaging of putting all of these pieces together and, and, and making it one cohesive story. So you can I ask, messaging versus creative and branding, how is it different? Just help me understand that, sorry. Uh, let's see. Um, the difference being is I can say, um, this product is going to save you 50% on your energy bills. Okay, you just say, we're going to save through these combination of technology. That's what we say. It's going to save you 50% of your energy bills through this technology. On the creative side, that wouldn't be just, you don't regurgitate that. You may show, okay, let me do creative. It's a video. And the video starts with, you got this, you got this bill, an energy bill. 
You were so frustrated. Oh my God, this, this line item was so expensive. What can I do? So you first start with the pain and that's part of the creative. Then you say, oh my God, I now bought this product that told me it'll save. And then it shows you, oh, and it saved. And here's all the ways it saved you that month. And it tells you that stuff. So one thing is stating what it does. The other one is showing what it does and putting it in your context, right? So that's the creative angle. Do I use a tweet for that? Do I use a video for that? Do I use a blog post? Do I, what do I need to do to turn that message and bring life to it? Bring it form and shape that will interact with the customers where they are. Can I ask you, what do you do when you fucked up product marketing? So you've launched your product and the product marketing just didn't hit. The messaging didn't hit. People did not resonate. What do you do then? Because you've launched, you've launched with the messaging, you've launched with it. Do you walk it back? Do you change it? Do you keep it out there and push it more? What's the, what do you do then? Well, first, if it didn't resonate, for whatever reason, and you didn't follow the steps of good product marketing, well, you didn't follow the good process to do it, right? So follow the process, have something. Don't just perfume the pig at the end of the, at the end of the development. Make sure you start initially. So let's assume that you started initially and it didn't work. Well, guess what? The iPod was a critical success, but it didn't really turn into a successful business till the third generation. And the reason being was it didn't work with Windows-based PCs. It only worked with Macs, which were a fraction of the market, less than a percent, you know, of just the U.S., not the rest of the world. So think about that. So we came out with an amazing product, but for a very, very small audience. And then what we said was, Shh. it was all, and for Steve, his opinion was, we're going to sell the iPod. It's going to be so awesome that people will buy Macs so they could use their iPod. We're going to sell more Macs because they're going to need to buy one to use an iPod that they're going to have to have. Well, guess what? The first two generations, that's where we stuck with. It didn't work. People didn't buy more Macs. The reason for the iPod to exist was for people to buy more Macs, not just because we wanted to be an iPod company. It was to sell more Macs. So the third generation, we finally bit the bullet, looked at all the data and, and said and, and convinced Steve we have to make this Windows compatible. And then once it became Windows compatible, then people started going, oh, I like this Apple experience, but I'm only getting part of it. What could it be like on a Mac? And then the Mac sales started because the cost of the iPod before was the cost of the iPod plus a Mac, which could be $2,000, $3,000. After we made the change, the cost of the iPod was the $300 or $249 or whatever it was, plus your PC. And then ultimately you bought a Mac. Right. Look, remember, I don't, you know, you're too young for this, but in the <laughs> 90s, in the 90s and early 2000s, when you walked into airport lounges, there were only PCs everywhere. And if you saw a Mac, you were lucky to see a Mac and you're like, oh, my God, I got to go talk to that guy because, you know, he's part of my tribe because it was a very rare tribe. Go to airport lounges today. Good luck finding anyone on a Windows PC. And if they are, it's some corporate PC they wish they never had to touch. Right? <laughs> it's a ThinkPad. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Right? Uh, yeah. So, and, and everyone else has Macs. And that was because simply we made the switch from making the iPhone only work or the iPod, iPod only work with Macs to making it work with everything. And then people started coming into the into the, the, into the whole community of Mac lovers. Can I ask, you know, we, we look at the products that you've worked on and it seems kind of just like hit after hit after hit when you kind of go through Oh, them. yeah, right. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, this is the joy of hindsight. Can you take me to a product flop that, and, and what you learned from a product flop? Product flop? Yeah. Well, like you General launched... Magic product flop, right? General Magic was a huge one. It maybe sold a few thousand units, you know, after... $500 million or more investment in the 90s. Were you a leader right? there? Like as a product leader? I wasn't a product. No, I wasn't a product leader. I was, when you I were was, a product leader, what's been a... You want a product leader? Is, yeah. Was a failure? There's failure as a business and there's failure as a product. Which one do you want to talk about? The product failure or a business failure? I want both. <laughs> okay. So let's talk about where the product met the needs, but the business failed. And that was at Philips. We were creating the Nino and Velo lines of pocket communi or pocket 
electronics. It was Windows CE based stuff. Um, that was a embedded operating system from Windows uh, for doing mobile for mobile computing for professionals like mobile Excel and email and stuff like that. So we had critical success there. People said ours was the best product of the category by far. Everything was going well in terms of those reviews. But where it was a business failure was sales and marketing could care less inside the company. They were busy worrying about getting their bonuses for TV sales and DVD sale, player sales, and those kinds of things. We were so low on the totem pole, they could care less. They're like, yeah, just throw it out to the retailers. Let's see if this is successful. We're not going to spend much on marketing. We're not going to do all that stuff. And of course, it failed. So that was a case where we had critical product success, but the business success didn't happen because we didn't have a good shot where back in the day, there were no e-tailers at the, at the point. This is 97, yeah. right? 96, 97. There was no e-tailing. There's none of this stuff going on. We had to have everything was about being in retail and in the mail order catalogs or what have you. And to make sure we had good merchandising. Didn't have it. Good branding. Didn't have it. You know, and that's why that was a critical success, product success, but a business failure. So that's one. That's one. So product success there, but business failure. What about one way? You just fucked it on the product. The product? <laughs> yeah. Well, um, where I was the product leader. Yeah. Or I would say product kind of thing. I think the biggest one, well, one of the big ones was um, uh, at Apple was the iPod Hi-Fi. I don't know if anyone remembers it, but I, the Apple I, iPod Hi-Fi was all about um, was all about bringing stereo, big stereo sounds to fill a room with an iPod. You could dock it, and then it would have these big speakers and everything. And that was a project that was something we all believe should exist. It all had the right things going for it, but the mark it was too early. It was too early in the market. And people are like, why am I paying $4.99 or $3.99 for an iPod Hi Fi? My iPod's only worth so much money. Why am I buying this big accessory for it um, to fill a room? I'll do it some other way. Well, obviously, today we see incredibly expense, expensive Bluetooth speakers, you know, of all you know, of all forms and sizes and Wi-Fi speakers and price points and everything else. That was the precursor. We were starting the market, but we didn't deliver it right because it was too expensive. It was over-designed. It was all kinds of things because we didn't get the product set right. I think you saw this with the Apple HomePod. Yeah. Right? The HomePod did the same thing. It was over-designed and everything and then said, oh, we have to, we have to compete with the Mini. You know, with the, with the Mini, we'll compete with all the other solutions out there. So sometimes you can overshoot. The same thing happened with the original Mac Cube. The Mac Cube overshot. Um, what, do you, what, what, remember, what do you, what do you, what do you, all, all, what, what are you all, just trying too hard? What are your lessons from the overshoot from the try too hard? You know, here's another one. Uh, and I'll tell you the, just to give another example, like the first time the Apple watch came out, it was trying to be a jewelry piece. Remember there was the $20,000 yeah. gold, you know, watch it's when it's trying too hard. Instead of just talking about the differentiation it becomes, it is, and focusing on that, it's over-engineering every element to be something to, because you're, I'm going to put it this way, you don't know when to stop. You don't have enough constraints. So that's the big thing that we had different between General Magic and iPod and some of the other things I did. Was at General Magic, we had almost unlimited funds and tons of time. What I learned at General Magic is really focus and put constraints on yourself so you're more creative and that you ship. So in the case of something like the iPod Hi-Fi, it had too big a budget. It took too long to ship. We should have much, we should have much more constrained it to get to a point and then figured out if we wanted to ship it or not. That was what we did on the iPhone. We had two and a half versions really of the iPhone before it shipped because we kept revving it getting to a certain point, throwing it away, trying again, getting to a certain point, throwing it away because we made constraints on time and what could actually be done. You need to have really good constraints to avoid these kinds of product nightmares. 
um can i ask, uh, actually that, that's a really good one which is like you know so many of my companies today have like 300 months of runway thanks to co2 or softbank um how do you enforce um time constraints and urgency on product teams who are sitting there going Poof, we got so much runway baby I you decree it you decree it you know a lot of times and you see this in in, in vc deals now there's certain milestones or tranches slices of funds that come in for hitting certain milestones so when we're raising a ton of capital I like to see a milestone-based plan for the investment. Yeah, you might have got 150 million, but you're only going to get the first 50 million, on, on, and then the next 50 million will be if you hit these milestones. Now, obviously, things can change or what have you, but I don't like to be swimming in money. I don't like any team swimming in money. I saw that too many times uh, at other companies I worked with or for, and it does not set up for good constraints to make sure you're making great decisions because the market moves on. So you might be have one idea of what it is and you're just going for it, but you're taking a long time and the market's moving away from it. And then you finally ship it and it dies and you're so far off track that everyone's just, Ugh, I don't want to deal with this anymore. Kill it. We, we've know? mentioned success and failure on product launch and product flop there. How do the best product leaders prevent teams that continuously smash it from getting too arrogant? And how do they also prevent teams that flop from losing all confidence and losing morale? Look, it all comes down to leadership. And the leadership is really, look, let's, you, you, gotta, you have to have enough experience. Like, let's not get too ahead of ourselves. You know, yes, we were successful last time. But and we're raising the stakes this time because every great leader, once you hit the bar, every great leader is going to raise those stakes a little bit more for them taking on more risk, right? But what you don't want to do is take on so much risk that it's like we can conquer the world. You want to get miss, risks that you can mitigate, that you can see for the most part. Maybe you do a few things you don't know, and those aren't so critical. But it's the job of the leader to push. Right. And to, to, to make stretch goals for things, but not so much that they're ludicrous, but stretch goals that the team believes in, that they can hit. That would be leap, so you can leapfrog yourself from the last version. You can continue to stay differentiated moving forward. Too many times the leader's like, oh, that was great or what have you. And we're just going to make it a little bit more. And we're just going to, you know, never put any more risk in our way. We're just going to kind of, you know, have fun here at the country club now that we set it up. That's when, you know, Andy Grove had a great, you know, phrase, you know, the paranoid survive. And this is all, you know, a great leader always has to be looking behind its back going, oh, wait a second. There's competition coming because if we're successful, the competition will be coming. Absolutely, because they're going to want what you've got. So you got to stay ahead of yourself if you're in the lead. So you got to you got to be adding those risks, but you got to do it in a constraint based way so that, you know, um, you do take bigger risks but they're within reason and you're not resting on your loyals, lo laurels. But should competition drive product strategy? Oh my God. No, 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 absolutely not. Never. Now, maybe when you're entering a market, you have to worry about competition because you have to understand what the table stakes are, the, the minimum feature sets you need to have to kind of play. So that, you know, you're not just giving them a new differentiated thing and there's all this other, you know, all these other things that you don't have. There are basic things that they're like, you don't have that. Everyone has that. So it depends if you're first to market versus you're coming into a market. But competition should inform, but it should not drive. Like so many times, you know, I would, you know, there's a CES that rolls around or some other trade show or some other, you know, every day now we get another press release about XYZ Corp raising this money or partnering with this or whatever. If you read those all the time, you are going to go crazy as a leader. If you're always tracking the competition, you're going to go crazy. So you have to understand where it is you're differentiating and know your differentiation stands and keep your ears and eyes open for those things that competitors might be doing and then scanning them to see. But don't go chasing the competition. Don't go trying to emulate the competition because all you do is end up with a me too and it's usually never as good. You've got to have your own uh, healthy ego to say, I think I know best and I think we know what was going on and we're going to make those decisions on behalf of the customer to, to, to continue our business forward. But to say it's just competition, now, if competition does come out with a better product, 
if competition does come and whomp you in some way, then you're like, what did we miss in our product marketing? What did we miss in our technology? And going back and learning from that, of course. But it, and yeah, maybe it'll make you to pivot or, or change your strategy slightly. But if you have to change really huge and, you know, huge um, problems to, to rip up everything and, and change again, you probably have the wrong process for how you went to market. What makes a you good know? post-mortem when you review? What makes a good post-mortem? Well, first, you got to show what you did right, right? So what did you get right in your post-mortem? What did you get wrong? And was this a macro issue or was this a micro issue? Macro issue means in the environment. Yeah. Was this something that just happened, you know, uh, and it was, you know, uh, how can I say this? It's like, uh, you know, the pandemic happened. Well, look, you can't blame any one business for the pandemic happening, right? So like, it's not like that was a macro thing that affect all of, uh, affected all of us. But if we screwed up and we didn't pivot properly within that macro environment and it becomes, a, you know, something we didn't do right, we didn't assess it right, well, then that's our problem. We didn't have the right process. So you have to really understand whether it's a macro thing, a macro, macro thing along the world, a macro thing in your industry you're competing in, right, or the competitive set, or if it's something internal that really was wrong. And you got, if you break it down into that, then you can better process the issues or the failures you might have had along the way so that you can spot those things in the future and try to avoid them. So you, you got to tear it down. People don't want to look failure in the face and they need to look at because unless they're going to just walk away and then it's truly failure. Failure becomes learnings and lessons learned if you apply those things to the next one and you go on, right? We could have looked at the first version of the iPhone that never shipped as a failure, but we didn't. We went on to make the second one. We could look at the second one as failure, but we didn't. We made a third one and that's what ultimately shipped. Those were just learnings along the way. Right, and there's an, I totally agree with you, and I love that. Do you do pre mortems? Final one before a quick fire. People often say about the importance now of pre mortems, predicting what could go wrong. Uh, I don't, think, you know, I don't spend too much time on pre mortems. So, you know, we spent a lot of time on that, you know, that press release, the mock press release, like I said, for product marketing. I think we we assess like um, here are the the big risks of the program, and make sure we enumerate those big risks of the program. And, and make a top 10 or 15 list and have it in every product meeting that we have with the teams so that we go, how are we doing our first five risks? How are we doing on the bottom five risks? We have names associated. Where's the next step on it? So that we're always mitigating those risks. So don't shy away from them. Make them transparent for everyone to see so that we're all working on the hardest things um, and to make sure those things are gone. Because typically those risky things are those things on the press release. Those are their differentiation things, right? And people like get it towards the end of the project and they're like, shit, we didn't get this done. We didn't nail this. Oh, just trim them off and we'll ship it anyways. If you go back to that core press release and you go, wait a second, three of the five things we mentioned in the press release, you want to jettison? Guess what? We don't have a product anymore. So again, that's the Occam's razor at the beginning is if you have a good understanding of what it is you're doing and it modifies over time, you know, that press release as you see better and you, you modify and you make it, you know, make it more streamlined. Um, that is a great way to say this is in the product or not, you know, because there's too many features. Everyone wants to over feature everything. We need this, just like you were saying at the beginning. We need to go after this customer segment. We need this because the competitors are doing that. It's like. No, guys, this is the right thing. Did something change fundamentally on this press release from in the competitive set, in the technology set, in the environment to not allow this to exist? If so, what is it? And let's address it. If not, let's move on and, and stick with our guns here. Okay, first quick fire question. How do you keep and integrate product marketing so tightly with product to ensure really great communications between the two? Well, they come to all the meetings first and foremost. Yeah. But secondly, that's the uh, this is the art of the product management position is they know to go in the hallway conversations or having offline conversations, going to lunches with people on the different parts of the product team or on the marketing team or whatever, and just getting to know people. Right. It's building those relationships. It shouldn't just be all happening in a meeting. This is all about relationships and building trust and saying, I'm going to share things when things aren't going right at certain parts of the project or certain parts of marketing so that they can have their ear to the ground, hear about these things and go, we need to address this. 
you know, or the team's really not feeling confident in their schedule about this. We need to look into it because if we can't make this this feature happen in the schedule, we got real problems. So let's go swarm on that. Let's go figure it out. So these people are not just formal voices of the customer. They're informal leaders in the team that, you know, are putting together these networks of people on in different aspects of the project to then be able to, you know, read the tea leaves, so to speak, the things that are unsaid in those big meetings. What are the single biggest mistakes you see founders make hiring their product teams today? Well, first, founders typically are the product managers, okay? They don't normally go and hire product management um, because sometimes they don't know what it is or they're like, I'm a product manager and that's the fun part. I like being the product manager, you know? And it is a lot of fun. But when you start growing past your, you know, 20 people, there is so much work to do product management, right? You need a person who's at least one person who's the voice of customer watching over all of this because as a founder, CEO, leader, you have so many other things to do. And I'm sorry, you don't get to do the stuff that you love to do. You get to do all the stuff that no one else is doing and, and, and talking to the customers and filling the cracks and finding the issues and reviewing work, not doing the work. You need to hire someone in the product marketing thing to drive it and build it and, and make sure they're always sitting there as a voice of customer. Now, you sit on top of all that, you know, making sure everyone's doing their jobs and everything. And you, it's not like you can't engage in the product management discussion, of course. But just like anything, you know, uh, I was an engineer. Should I be engineering when I'm a CEO? No. If, I'm a, if I love product marketing and I was a product marketer, now I'm a CEO, should I be doing product marketing? Sure, from a review perspective, but not doing it. Just like you wouldn't be doing it if you were an engineer or salesperson. So stop it. Hire and build the right team around product marketing and make sure it's a, it's a separate team. It's not marketing. It's not communications. It's not engineering. It's not project management. It's something else. Just like when design used to be embedded in engineering and stuff like that. Now design has been, oh, we have to have design. It has to be at the and user experience. It has to be reporting the CEO. Well, product management is just as important. Penultimate one for you. What do you want to achieve with your book, Tony? Why did you do it? <laughs> Why did I do it? Well, Build, Build is really a, a set of lessons. It's an advice encyclopedia, mentorship in a box. It is those 30 years of Silicon Valley and all the failings and the learnings coming together in trying to be concise to people building things that are usually doing something really hard, something new, the world's never seen. If you can get a few of those tips and maybe some of these will help you see more clearly, it's the, all of these tricks and advice, it's all human nature based. This is not about, you know, so, you know, some kind of engineering trick. This is about human nature. And this is about how to harness the brilliant humans in yourself and in in your teams or the teams you create and your customers and engaging with them in the right way to create and build the thing that you want to build and hopefully be successful at. So I, the only reason why I'm sitting here today, one of the only reasons, is because of all the people who helped me along the path, not through financial gain, but through my career path. They spotted something in me, I guess, or the way I talked or who knows it was and said, I'm going to help that guy. And I'd go and ask them for advice and they'd give me advice for free and, you know, they help out. And then, I, you know, and, and it would become a two-way street as I got more and more, you know, experienced over time. But people help to pull me up, okay? Help pull me up. Well, just before COVID, I, I, was, I was pinching myself going, my God, this is such an amazing life. And it's been, you know, such a life of learnings and all of these things. How did I get here? And I thought about it, about all these mentors that I had. And then... I thought most of them had died. And I was like, now I think the baton has been passed to me. I think it's time for me that I need to give back and be a mentor and pull other people up. And I could do that. We were already doing that in future shape with our investors, our, you know, our, you know, um, mentors with money way we think about things. But I was like, what could be broader? How can we, you know, we, we work with 200 companies, 200 plus companies. That's great. And CEOs and we help. But there are thousands and thousands of companies that need to be created, especially to help us with the climate crisis we have. 
These companies need to be created. They need to be built fast in the right way. Maybe this book will help those people and other people building important things. And it'll start a conversation. And hopefully that baton will, will have been passed to me and then I get to pass it to them um, and let them build stuff and, and then mentor other people. So this is really about just helping and giving back. What? Tony, I thought you were sitting here today because you loved hanging out with me. What is going <laughs> on? What a crap. That's a terrible answer. Uh, no, I want to finish, my friend, on the final one, which is you said before you like to ask the question of like what one company product first mile or experience did you really, really resonate with and love? If you think back to the last one for you, what was yours where you were blown away by it? Well, look, the one of my very first, you know, there was the Atari 2600. There was the Apple II. There was the Sony Walkman, you know. Those are all the things that I love, you know. What was the most kid, recent you know, one? What was the most, the most recent one? Yeah. That's a great question. What's the most recent blow away product experience that I had? Um, so mine was actually something, a present from the chain smokers, the band. They sent me a box of last sure. crumb cookies. Alex and those guys yeah, guys. Alex and Drew. They sent me last crumb cookies and they came in this big box and it opened beautifully you know when you open a box and it just does it so beautifully and then each cookie's hand like wrapped and the, when you zip it unzip it it's a beautiful unzip and it feels nice as a package well i you know i'll tell you the, the nothing ear ones so nothing the brand the ear ones you know they say okay and yes full disclosure i'm an investor Full disclosure, okay. I'm, I'm not. I'm not, and I use uh, their nothings. Okay, Fucking so you're amazing. Use them. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. But you, had, I think maybe you had the same product experience. There was the buying online, there was the community, there was getting it, there was unwrapping it, taking it out, then using it, and it really worked. And it hit the price point. Like to me, okay, is it the next iPhone? No. Is it the next whatever? But does it deliver on what they said and, and set the expectations? high enough and then they even bested those to me that is where it all comes together as that's an amazing experience and that's something that you can learn from i listen i totally agree i love carl i'm fucking pissed i didn't do that first round when buckley, <laughs> when buckley brought it to me i was like hardware company fuck off you should have talked to me oh no <laughs> uh, but listen tony i've loved this you're a hero thank you so much Thank, hey, thank you. Thank you, Harry. And one last thing for your for your listeners out there and viewers. Everything in the climate, uh, in, in, excuse me, we are starting a climate fund. It's called Build Climate Fund. All proceeds, all net proceeds that are coming to you know, me or what have you are going to a fund called the Build Climate Fund. I'm going to match all of those proceeds 5x, and we're only going to be inv investing in climate crisis companies, startups doing real stuff for helping the climate. And that money will be evergreen. So any any profits, any principal that comes back from those events goes back into supporting more and more companies, helping the climate crisis. And if any money is ever taken out, you know, in profits, those are going to go directly into climate saving, you know, uh, charities. OK, so this book is about giving back to everybody building and any money that's coming from it is going back into companies helping our planet and helping us, you know, our existential crisis we're in right now. So please go out. I hope you like the book, but, you know, you're supporting a good cause uh, and maybe there's some good stories you can learn from, too. You are here.